This video is brought to you by Galaxy Lamps. Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and today we are reviewing a video from the channel Be Amazed and the video is called Ridiculously Badass Armor and Why It Existed, link in the description. Really love what they have done with the thumbnail. As you can see I'm just here chilling with my friend the Frogmouth Helmet, he's a very sensitive boy so I just hope that whatever they say on this video they don't upset him. Let's go. Fighting has always been about more than just who has the bigger sword. Here are some examples of ridiculously badass armor and why it exists. Salad in the shape of a lion's head. Very nice. Now this incredible piece of metalwork is the earliest surviving example of Renaissance armor a la antica, or armor in the antique style if you don't speak French. It's wait, 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 wait. Did you just say French? Well, we're off for a good start. I mean, you know that whenever I make these debunking videos, I'm not attacking the creators or the channel. Much respect. In fact, I'm just attacking the content. And, and usually I, I, I want to be polite, but I'm not trying to be an asshole or anything. But please give me this one. You're telling me that the sound Alantica sounds French? You can't get more Italian than that. Oh my gosh, this one pisses me off. That's all right. Maybe, maybe it was a joke. Maybe it was a joke. Let's say it was a joke. Let's continue. I can't just get stuck on the first one. The salad itself is a shell which fits onto a steel helmet underneath. It represents the head of the Nemean lion, the famous feline slain and worn by the demigod Hercules in Greek mythology. Hercules is Roman mythology. Heracles is Greek mythology. But I understand. It's easy to get them confused. Pranker Helm European helmets of the 12th century had one major flaw. Ironically, they didn't really protect the head very well. But by the mid 13th century, that all changed. He just said that helmets in the 12th century didn't protect the head very well. Helmets in the 12th century protected the head very well. And also, why did he mention 13th century, but then they are showing first century Roman legionaries? A mistake by the editor? Let's try and understand what he could have possibly meant. And I think in this case, there are only two things that he could have meant. 12th century people didn't have the technology to be able to produce helmets that would work. The helmets in the 12th century were so bad compared to later helmets that they wouldn't work as good protection for the head. If this is what he means is completely wrong or simply because even a first century helmet would be a great protection for your head. This is a thousand years older technology compared to what we are talking about and yet this is fantastic. It's an Imperial Gallic Type H and it was a formidable piece of kit for the Roman army. And even if we go further back, I mean, this is a full bronze Montefortino helmet, still a great helm and an excellent protection for your head. So we don't even need to look at 12th century helmets to know that they were very good at protecting your head. Maybe what he meant to say is that 12th century helmets weren't a good helmet on a battlefield because they don't protect their face, differently from the sort of frog mouth helmets or full-on enclosing armets of later periods. Then that's also wrong. I mean, look at this. This is a late 15th century kettle hat. So this helmet was in use, specifically Northern Italian, when full protective armets and frog mouths were also used. And we know that knights own this and use them. How do we know? Well, first of all, we can just look at the purchasing lists where knights would literally order, yes, a full on armet, fully enclosing helmet, but also one of these. The reason being that, yes, you want full maximum protection when you're charging, but maybe after the charge, you want something with a bit more visibility or maybe your main helmet got compromised. So you're just telling your squire, give me that. Also, we know that people in the late 15th century thought that this was still adequate protection unless you were full on charging because we can see people using these and other open-faced helmet during an actual battle in iconography. Cavalry back in the 15th century were essential to hundreds of battle plans, alongside their own full coats of armor called barding. Uh, yeah, that's true, but then again, this specific barding and armor set is 16th century, not 15th, but... Parade armor of Henry II of France. Henry II of France, who ruled in the mid 15th century, held many wonderful sets of parade armor. Henry II of France ruled in the mid 16th century, not 15th century. I'm starting to see a pattern here. The infamous Filippo Negroli was a Renaissance master of ceremonial armor, producing some of the world's most famous burgonets from the 15th century. 16th century. Filippo Negroli is from the 16th century. I don't know what it is with 15th and 16th century here. Eh? A little confusion, perhaps. Ferdinand II of Austria. What do you get for the man who has everything? Well, if you're buying a gift for the Emperor of the Holy Roman Order... Better be Does he mean the Holy Roman Empire? 
Maybe a little slip of the tongue. Better be thinking of more than socks. This absolutely insane all antica armor and matching chaffron masterpiece was created by Lucio Piccinino in the 15th century. It was given as a gift to the Duke century. of Parma and Piacenza, Alessandro Fernis, such as Emperor Charles V and other members of the 15th century French court. Okay, okay, that's enough. I need to explain this. 15th century definition. A period from 1401 to 1500. If something is in 1530, 1513, 1550, 1570, it's all 16th century. Thank you. But now I would like to take a moment to mention the kind sponsor that made this video possible, Galaxy Lamps. Galaxy Lamps has just sent me their newest Galaxy Projector 2.0. This thing is amazing, I can't wait to show you and my wife. Today we're gonna try and test this projector both in my studio and, wait for it, in my armory. Like literally, I don't think it's ever been done to use a projector like this where you've got so much mirror polished plate armor. I personally think a galaxy projector like this one is a great gift, whether it be to yourself, whether it be to your significant one, or to a friend of yours. You get vibrant RGB colors and laser stars, transforming your room into a magical personal planetarium. You've got full control through the app, you can change the color, you can add or remove the laser stars, you can control the speed at which everything moves. Also, it's a great addition to your smart home because it works perfectly with Alexa. Are you ready? Yeah. Alright, turn off the light. Okay. Wow! Look at that! Welcome to the armory. Let's see what happens when I turn the lights off. That's the most starry armory I've ever seen. Look at that frog mouth. Now, if you want to get a projector like this, well, now is the time. Go into the description, click the link galaxylamps.co slash metatron and use my discount code metatron to get a 15% off your purchase. And big thanks to Galaxy Lamps for sponsoring my video. Horned Helmet of Henry VIII Henry VIII was famous for beheading his wives. So what kind of gift do you get a man who's clearly missing good heads in his life? Obviously, this bizarre horned helmet. It was gifted to Henry VIII by none other than Emperor Maximilian I, the very same man who conquered courts and politics with his... No, that's not the very same man. That's the Emperor of Mexico. You got the, you got the wrong Maximilian I there. Ooh, frogmouth time. Let's go. The Brocus Helm. Gorgeous. Until the 14th century, helmets seen out on the battlefields were the same as those used in jousts. The design was fine for vision, but savage blows to the head could be fatal, as they weren't designed to withstand big impacts. All helmets throughout history were specifically designed to withstand big blows to the head. That is exactly what helmets were designed for. If not, why would people wear them on a battlefield? So changes were made to the traditional designs and specific jousting helmets were crafted such as the Brocus Helm. It's a frog mouth helm that has a protruded lower edge of the vision slit, which juts forward and upward to prevent a glance slipping into the jouster's eyes. At the time, this was cutting edge jousting fashion, except it also weighed over 10 kilograms, which would have the equivalent effect of riding into a fight with three large bricks on your head. On your head, be it quite literally. Actually, no. <laughs> Actually, no. So, it's true that frogmouth helmets tend to be very heavy, although then again, it literally chose probably one of the heaviest in the spectrum, because not all frogmouth helmets have that kind of weight. But still, there is something that I think is important to underline when it comes to frogmouth helmets and weight distribution. Okay, here we are. I'm even wearing my tassets, which I don't wear all the time. Okay, so I think we need to clarify this idea of wearing really heavy helmets. This is not a 10 kilograms helmet, but it's close to 8 kilograms, so it is a very heavy one. It's a hefty boy. The thing is, though, that there are several ways to wear a frog mouth helmet like this one, and there are several possible configurations, and in general, medieval armorers, and this is really my point here, knew what they were doing. So, weight distribution, the way it's set up, the padding inside this, which I'll show you in a second, all of these things are taken into consideration when creating a helmet like this, because it needs to be functional. It's absolutely not like wearing bricks on your head. So let's put the helmet on and let's see what it feels like to wear a very heavy helmet like this one. 
All right, so first of all, the padding inside is really helping in making it a much more comfortable experience. But I also have to see that if you see, I've got a strap. And what these straps, particularly when you use the helmet for jousting, they would be used to connect the helmet to the breastplate and the back plate, so in the front and in the back. And the same thing was achieved sometimes with full on bolting. Now, early examples of frog mounts that were used in battle didn't use this kind of strapping method because in battle you need to be able to turn your head. And so if you look at the way frog mouths were worn on the battlefield instead, they would leave a little gap and they would be further up and sort of suspended over your head. Also, we see lots of multiple holes in your straps, which suggest the idea that several possible configurations could be used. A lot of thought is being put into this to make it a realistic experience for a functional warrior. The Pranker Helm is an example of a highly improved 13th century pot helm. Made from reinforced pre-strapped metal plate, it compromised the wearer's field of vision to two narrow slits in favor of full facial defense. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, w whenever you increase defense, uh, particularly in a fully enclosed, enclosing helmet, uh, your vision is going to decrease, but not as much as you would think. Let me demonstrate very quickly with something that it's even more compromising than that. Let me show you. Also, when it comes to your vision, yes, I have only one slit here, but my peripheral vision is really good. I can see my fingers all the way up to here. I can still see them. Okay, now they're starting to disappear, but here I can see them. If I need to look up, I can do that. This is where my vision is blocked with this type of helmet. So anything below this, I don't see when I'm looking straight. But if I look down, of course, I can see much more than people think. Samurai armor. Go. In feudal Japan, the life of a samurai meant being constantly on the move. Heavy armor was a burden, so the ingenious design of the tatami gosoku became a standard amongst all classes of samurai. In English, tatami gosoku... Well, heavy armor was absolutely used by the samurai. I mean, it's, yeah, not in the sense, yeah, uh, tatami gosoku would definitely be a lighter choice and there was a huge spectrum of possible choices but if you look at like 12th century samurai their armor was so heavy usually referred to the modern term oyoroi which wasn't used in the period but that one was so heavy that it would be heavier than some of the european plate counterpart and most of that weight would be on your shoulders so uh, no samurai weren't always looking into a light options and weren't, weren't always thinking oh heavy armor is a burden so we don't wear it this is a huge myth that uh, people have repeated over and over again knights wanted heavy armor but samurai chose light armor but it's absolutely important to say that in 12th century japan the majority of wealthy and successful samurai were wearing armor that was extremely heavy again i'd like to say that many other options such as the tatami gusoku but also the domaru and lighter versions of armor absolutely existed and some samurai did choose to get those back in the day armor could even be used as propaganda under the right circumstances. Take these gauntlets that look like they've been plucked out of Lord of the Rings, for example. They belong. It's probably the other way around is the Lord of the Rings has been plucked out from those gauntlets. They belong to Emperor Maximilian I of the Holy Roman Empire, one of the most powerful rulers of Europe in the 15th century. The aggressively stylish nature of these kinds of garments would have made them almost unusable. I disagree. They are absolutely functional. Um, they don't look that different from the ones that were used in battle. They're just more highly decorated, but they would absolutely work. But they did the job of making him look like a powerful man who knew what he was doing. Remember kids, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Again, I'd like to say hello to our friends at Be Amazed channel, and uh, the only reason why I'm being a little bit nitpicky when it comes to these things is because of the kind of reach that they have. Because I mean, 11 million subscribers, uh, I think it's important to double check a couple of things here and there. I make mistakes myself, which is why I always accept uh, people correcting me, uh, but I think it's also important to be able to, you know, have a little bit of a discussion, particularly if some of the things uh, that they are saying are not necessarily based on their own personal experience with wearing some of the helmets that we see on this show. Regardless of that, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure you remember to click the link in the description to make use of the amazing offer and 15% discount for your Galaxy Lamb. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.